Welcome everyone to the January 2023 meeting of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. The uh, Humanist Society of Santa Barbara is a 501c3 nonprofit, 100% volunteer run educational corporation founded in the mid 1990s. And we've got about 120 members, which is about one out of every thousand people in Santa Barbara area. We always welcome new members who might be interested in finding out more about humanism or hanging out with us. And our speaker today is Dr. Eugenie Scott talking about creationism, why creationism may be coming back to our schools. But before you get started, let's take a look at why would humanists care about this topic? How does this relate to the topic of humanism? Well, I looked at the affirmations of humanism that were written by uh, Paul Kurtz, and there were four that spoke to me. One is that as humanists, we're committed to the application of reason and science to the understanding of the universe and to the solving of human problems. We deplore efforts to denigrate human intelligence or to seek to explain the world in supernatural terms or to look outside nature for salvation. We're committed to the principle of the separation of religion from government, and we're deeply concerned with the education of our children, and we want to nourish reason and compassion. So those four seem to me to fit right in with the idea of creationism coming back to our schools. So I think all of you know who Eugenie Scott is, but I just wanted to <clears throat> remind you of all that she's accomplished. So she is the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education, which is a nonprofit of scientists, teachers, and others that work to improve the teaching of science as a way of knowing, the teaching of evolution, and the teaching of climate change. She's a former college professor. She's an internationally known expert on the creationism evolution controversy and science denialism. She has received Lifetime Achievement Awards, both from the American Humanist Association, as well as the Center for Inquiry, and has received the James Randi Award from the Skeptic Society. She also received the Richard Dawkins Award from the Atheist Alliance International, and in 2009, Scientific American named her one of 10 outstanding leaders involved in research business or policy pursuits that have advanced science and technology. She holds 10 honorary doctorates. But the most impressive thing, in my view, is that she has her own asteroid. <laughs> so 249540, Eugenie Scott, there it is in orbit, outside Mars's orbit. I want to know, how do you get one of those? That's really cool. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Eugenie, and thank you so much for honoring us with your talk today. Well, thank you so much, Judy. That's very kind of you. And let me share my screen. Yeah, about the asteroid. The good news is it's not aimed at us. So, you know, everybody relax a little bit. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. I know I've spoken for you all previously, but I... I'm embarrassed to say, I don't remember when it was, but suffice to say that I imagine enough time is spent between then and now that uh, what I'm going to say today will not be identical to what I was talking about then. As I was preparing this talk, uh, there was an article in the New York Times that I saw on a topic that thee and me are quite interested in, the separation of church and state. And as I read, I came across this paragraph describing the governor of Montana. For more than 25 years, Gianforte has belonged to a church in Bozeman, adhering to a literal interpretation of the Bible that rejects evolution and considers homosexuality a sin. Gianforte and his wife have contributed to an organization that funds scholarships at private schools, many of which are Christian, a Montana fossil museum that challenges evolution, and it goes on. Now, you might very well be saying, what? <laughs> this guy is a governor, and he thinks dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. Well, actually, there's a lot of creationism around, but it tends to be a little below the radar for people like humanists. The Montana Fossil Museum referred to in that New York Times article is the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum, which opened up in 2009. 
Now, the Glendive Museum takes the position that everything in the universe, including humans and dinosaurs and stars and my asteroid, was created at one time in essentially its present form, and that the Earth is about 10,000 years old rather than billions of years. In other words, straight up young Earth creationism. Now, this isn't some storefront. Uh, it's got the second largest collection of dinosaur fossils in Montana, which is no slouch when it comes to dinosaur fossils. According to the Tourist Bureau, there are 14 dinosaur museums in Montana. The most famous is the Museum of the Rockies, which is real science. But the Glendive Museum is second in size and uh, probably quality. It's pretty well done, judging from the photographs that I was able to see online. Now, the Glendive Museum isn't the only creationist museum around either, and it certainly isn't the largest. In northern Kentucky is the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum, which opened in 2007 with an exhibit area of over 60,000 square feet. In addition to exhibits, it includes a planetarium, a petting zoo, and an auditorium for lectures. This auditorium is where the debate between Bill Nye the Science Guy and Answers in Genesis director Ken Ham was held in 2014. AIG has a pretty good footprint in northern Kentucky. Here is part of it. They do all their museum building and design work and exhibit preparation in-house, and that large structure on their right is where they fabricate these uh, exhibits. AIG also has another impressive creationist destination site, the Ark Encounter, or as we like to call it for alliterative purposes, the Ark Park. It opened in 2016 and claims a million attendees per year, although there are reasons to believe that this number is inflated a bit. One calculation has the Ark Park bringing in only 700 to 800,000 a year, but that's still a lot of people. A lot of people attend the Ark Park. AIG just bought the Toyota plant in northern Kentucky to use for offices and for a school they plan to open, so they must be getting a lot of donations. The ark that they built there is really big. You have some people there in the front for scale. It's 510 feet long, so a football field and a half. Currently, the Ark Park features just a model of Noah's Ark, but AIG has raised almost $20 million to pay for a model first century Jerusalem. It's going to have a Tower of Babel Visitor Center and 5D movie theater. And they also plan an amusement park ride through the plagues of Egypt, which is just hilarious. I mean, I can just you know say, buckle up, kids, here come the boils. The most recent, except for the continually expanding AIG museums, is in Dallas, where the Institute for Creation Research opened their museum in September 2019. And just like the AIG museums, ICR paid cash for building it. Now, I can go on for a long time talking about creationist museums. Wikipedia lists 13, and you can read all about them online. They range from New York to California, and most of them are small, but several are multi-million dollar operations. There are reports of public school children being taken to these museums, which is problematic from a number of standpoints, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Speaking of education, the good news is that there are not many legislatures trying to pass bills requiring the teaching of creationism, although that was not always the case. But as recently as 2021, a bill was proposed in Arkansas that would allow teachers to teach creationism. Section 1 calls for a teacher of kindergarten through grade 12 science class at a public school or open enrollment public charter school may teach creationism as a theory of how the earth came to exist. Note that creationism is to be taught in science class, not as comparative religion, not as literature or folklore, but as science. In other words, something that is empirically demonstrated and you have some reason to believe is actually factual. Now this seems kind of odd, why would they worry about teaching it in science class, but that gets us back to the history of this controversy. So let's take a look at that very briefly. The history of anti-evolutionism can be broadly divided into three periods. First, the attempt was made to ban it, then to balance the teaching of evolution with the teaching of some religious view. Finally, in the present time, the anti-evolution movement is concentrating on belittling evolution. In other words, presenting it as if it were inadequate science. 
Within this history are three strategies that creationists have used for decades. We call them the pillars of creationism. The first pillar is to challenge the validity of the science. It's claimed that the science is unsettled or weak or unsupported, and therefore the student should just re really not take this evolution stuff very seriously. The second is an ideological pillar. Evolution, or more recently, climate change, must be rejected because it's not compatible with some ideology. Obviously, with creationism, the ideology is uh, religious. And finally, the third pillar reflects cultural values important to American society. Fairness and balance, free speech, letting all voices be heard, and so forth. An application of this in the education setting is to propose that students receive both views and decide for themselves as a way to develop critical thinking skills. Now you'll see that these three pillars of creationism are woven into the history with some given more emphasis during different periods. The heyday of the banning of evolution period was between approximately 1919 and 1927 which includes the Scopes trial of 1925, featuring William Jennings Bryan on the right and Clarence Darrow on the left, the most famous legal figures of their day. By the way, Clarence Darrow gets kind of a bad rap, but you guys know that because you, know, you did inherit the wind. The Scopes trial is legendary as a triumph of modernism over traditionalism, but Scopes lost. And the law that Scopes was tried under, and several copycat laws in other states, remained on the books in Tennessee and other places until the 1970s. These anti-evolution laws uh, resulted in evolution quietly slipping out of the textbooks and the high school curriculum for about the next 30 years. Evolution didn't return to the high school biology curriculum until the science education reforms of the Sputnik era in the late 50s and early 60s. At this time, the National Science Foundation put money into the development of high school science textbooks that were written by master teachers and professional scientists. So, of course, they included evolution. Now, these books sold well, they were popular, and so they were therefore cloned by commercial textbook publishers, and evolution re-entered the high school curriculum. But the state of Arkansas, contemplating buying these new books that included evolution, still had one of these old Scopes era 1920s laws on its books. A 25-year-old high school biology teacher, Susan Epperson, was chosen by the Arkansas branch of the National Education Association to be the plaintiff in what everybody assumed would just be a little housekeeping exercise. Just, you know, get rid of this silly law so that the teachers can use the new books. Hold on, let's move on. Little did Susan know <laughs> that a state judge would uphold the law and that her case would be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court as Epperson versus Arkansas, which struck down Scopes type laws banning evolution. The return of evolution to the high school curriculum ushered in the next era of the anti-evolution crusade, the effort to balance the teaching of evolution with some form of creationism. Now, initially, this took the form of requiring students to teach Genesis if they taught evolution. Now, I'm going to remind you a little bit of your high school civics, and we're going to take a quick look at the First Amendment. First Amendment has two clauses regarding religion, the establishment and first exercise clauses. Now, when you look at these taken together, you can read them logically as calling for public institutions such as schools or city councils or whatever, to be neutral toward religion. You can neither inhibit nor advance religion. Teaching the Bible to balance evolution obviously was advancement of religion. So laws requiring balancing evolution with the Bible were quickly struck down in the courts. But creationists had other options. A movement began in the early 1960s called Creation Science. Scientific creationism is a movement claiming that it's possible to scientifically support a literalist biblical special creation view, such as the universe, including my asteroid, were all created at one time. The earth is only thousands of years old, and the sudden creation took place over a very short period of time, and that this can be supported through science. Now, they don't actually have scientific evidence for this, needless to say. They merely anomaly monger. They comb through the scientific literature looking for anomalies that they claim will disprove or weaken the evidence for evolution. Now, a number of years ago, a judge referred to 
a contrived dualism in creationism that there's only two alternatives there's either evolution or there's creationism so evidence against evolution is evidence for creationism all they need to do in this contrived dualism is just prove that evolution is wrong and therefore creationism wins by default so they're not really looking for evidence for creationism now, during the 1970s and early 80s, legislation was introduced into over 25 states, including California, to require the teaching of creation science. Most were defeated, but Louisiana and Arkansas passed this kind of legislation, and the Louisiana case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Edwards versus Aguilard in 1987, declaring that the advocacy of creationism in public schools was not constitutional. In striking down the teaching of creation science, uh, the court also commented that teachers could certainly teach all scientific theories about the origins of humankind. They just couldn't teach religious ones. Creationists considered creation science to be a scientific theory, but since it failed, they came up with another scientific theory called intelligent design. So even if they couldn't teach creation science, they could accomplish their goals by teaching intelligent design. But guess what? Intelligent design is just a subset of creation science. It's just relabeled creation science. ID focuses on the idea of design, that there are some natural phenomena that are so complicated that they categorically cannot be explained through natural causes. Not that they have not yet been explained, but they cannot be. They're just off the table. They can only be explained by reference to an intelligence. Now, of course, the intelligence is God, but intelligent design proponents believe that by being a bit less obvious about their religious roots, they would be able to duck the Establishment Clause. But as the Venn diagram there suggests, everything found in ID is also found in creation science. And nothing in ID is unique to intelligent design. The idea that nature is too complex for mindless natural causes, as they put it, is also at the heart of creation science. Also is the case that there are claims made by creation science proponents that are not found in ID, such as the young age of the earth. And intelligent design succeeded remarkably well in being taken as a serious criticism of evolution from its appearance in the early 1990s through the mid-2000s. After the mid-2000s, on the other hand, it faded. And the reason for this was a district court case, Kitzmiller versus Dover. Kitzmiller was at the time a very large news story with all of the networks and major print publications covering the case. This is Nick Motsky, uh, known to some of you as an NCSE employee at the time. And this man here, you'll see a little bit later on, that's Richard Katsky of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Nova produced a two-hour documentary in 2007 called Judgment Day. It got a Peabody Award and several other awards. It's really good. Check it out if you haven't seen it yet. So some of you may already be familiar with this case. In Dover, Pennsylvania, a school board voted to require the teaching of intelligent design. Teachers resisted and even tried to compromise, but the board was relentless and insistent upon their view. And after many rancorous school board meetings, the parents in the community decided to sue. On the side of the teachers were my organization, the National Center for Science Education, the ACLU, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and a large law firm based in Philadelphia, Pepper Hamilton, where one of NCSE's legal advisory committee members was a partner. That's him right here, Eric Rothschild. We filed on December 18, 2004, and the trial began in September of 2005, it took place over six weeks. On the other side was the Thomas More Law Center from Michigan, whose motto is the sword and shield for people of faith, led by Richard Thompson. Now, why couldn't we just go to the judge and say, judge, this intelligent design policy is really bad science. Tell them not to teach it. As sensible as that sounds, remember that we're in a court of law and the teaching of bad science is not against the law. There's absolutely nothing in the Constitution that says don't teach bad science. The Establishment Clause, however, says public institutions can't advance religion. So that is what we had to do in presenting our case. We had to show the judge that the school boards was advocating religion by requiring the teaching of intelligent design, which we did in multiple ways. It's very satisfying. 
it's a fascinating story, and I can yammer on about Kitzmiller for, for hours, but I have other stories to tell today, so I'll just skip over to the end. We won. Uh, in December of 2005, the judge issued his decision that the Dover policy was unconstitutional. That was, by the way, on December 20th, which has been Kitzmas for us ever since. And that little gray-haired lady over there in the corner is looking pretty happy with very good reason. Because ever since, we have had no creationism or intelligent design lawsuits. The creation science proponents have almost entirely give up trying to get their ideas into the public school curriculum. Not completely. Remember that 2021 creationism law in Arkansas that I showed you earlier. And after Dover, the intelligent design proponents have also given up trying to get legislation passed. But by the mid-2000s, another creationist strategy had developed and was being emphasized. Recall that in the 1987 Edwards versus Aguilar decision, striking down the teaching of creation science, Brennan had commented that it was okay to teach scientific alternatives to evolution, which encouraged the development of intelligent design as a way to balance the teaching of evolution. Well, Kitzmiller discouraged that, discouraged that approach, and we haven't heard much from the ID folks ever since. But Justice Scalia had a dissent that suggested another line of attack. Scalia suggested that it would be okay to teach the evidence against evolution. Now, remember the contrived dualism that I mentioned earlier? That with only the choices of evolution and creationism, evidence against evolution is evidence for creationism. So if they can teach the evidence against evolution in classes, they will win by default. So even if creationism and later intelligent design was not constitutional to teach, much of the same effect could be achieved by teaching evidence against evolution. Creationists seized on this immediately after Edwards. Teachers should be encouraged to teach the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes, not just arguments against some proposed evolutionary mechanism. So, you know, not just that natural selection can't do this, that, or the other but against evolution per se, even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. It's my emphasis, obviously. This brings us to the third and current historical stage of anti-evolutionism, belittling evolution. I thank Glenn Branch, my NCSE colleague. Ban balance and belittle is a great alliterative one, two, three, and he's the one who came up with that. I had much clunkier examples. The contention in belittling evolution is to teach evolution because you have to, but also teach that evolution is weak science so that evolution is discredited. In the belittling approach, religious issues are downplayed. The courts have spoken, so creationists need to present an approach that doesn't look like it's religious. They know they'll lose if it does. The belittling evolution has a number of catchphrases associated with it. Teaching evolution is theory, not fact, and of course, this is not theory in the way that scientists use theory. It's guess or hunch, like I've got a theory about that. Teach the controversy is the idea that you lie to students, that scientists are arguing about whether or not evolution happened. They are not arguing about whether evolution happened. They're arguing about how it happened. But teach the controversy is a sneaky way to work in that American tradition of fairness and fair play and so forth. Academic freedom, again, a call out to American um, fairness ideas, evidence for and evidence against evolution, strengths and weaknesses of evolution, a critical analysis of evolution. All of these are catchphrases that you find in the legislation or school policies that are promoting the belittling approach. By the way, critical analysis is not critical analysis. The translation of critical analysis in creationism speak is criticize. Now, a lot of people sign on to the contrived dualism that there are only two options. So discrediting evolution does support creationism. And proponents make a pedagogical argument as well. It's good for students to practice their critical thinking skills by looking at all the evidence. During the 2000s and the 2010s, we saw a lot of this belittling approach in science education standards and in proposed legislation and school board policies and the rest. Two states passed belittling type legislation, Tennessee and Louisiana, but neither of these have been challenged in court, mostly because this approach is a lot 
more slippery from a legal standpoint. Like I say, the Constitution doesn't protect against the teaching of bad science. But we may be on the precipice of a major change regarding the teaching of evolution or creationism in the public schools going forward. Remember the First Amendment, Establishment and Free Exercise Clauses. The understanding that the religion clauses call for public institutions to be religiously neutral has been weakening over the last 20 years or so, as the Supreme Court has become more and more conservative. Establishment has been interpreted more narrowly as, what did the founding fathers mean by establishment? Some conservative justices have concluded that establishment of religion in colonial days referred only to having a state religion. So anything less than establishing a state religion is fair game. So prayer in school or creationism, whatever. This, of course, gives primacy to the free exercise clause, and we have seen that in a number of recent decisions. There are various versions of this approach, generally referred to as originalism, of which Scalia and Thomas have been the strongest supporters, but arguably, all of the conservatives on the court hold to one form of originalism or another. There are certain types of cases that have been considered establishment clause cases. Prayer in institutions associated with government, prayer in schools, city council meetings, and so forth. Religious displays in public spaces, crosses, including one here in California, or creches and the like. The funding of religion by the public often focuses on schools. For example, buying textbooks or providing transportation for students in parochial schools. In 2022, the Supreme Court decided that Maine must provide vouchers to parents that want to send their children to private schools, including parochial schools. A fourth category is curriculum content in public schools. Traditionally, establishment clause cases have been decided based on a 1971 precedent called Lemon versus Kurtzman. Now, Lemon versus Kurtzman was a case involving practices in Rhode Island and Pennsylvania regarding whether these states could use tax money to pay teachers and buy supplies, purchase textbooks, and so forth for private religious schools. In the case of Pennsylvania, the question was if they could use federal funds to reimburse private schools teachers when they taught secular classes. Justice Brennan decided they couldn't based on a three-part test he had devised. Does the practice or the law have a religious purpose? Once it's in effect, does it have any the effect of promoting or denigrating religion? Does it cause undue entanglement with religion? Does the government have to involve itself with too much interference with religion? The justices decided in Lemon that the Rhode Island and Pennsylvania governments would have to have too much supervision of the schools to be sure that, for example, a teacher that they were paying was getting paid by the state only for teaching secular topics, not for teaching religious topics, which would involve the state in too much entanglement with the school, too much entanglement with religion. Interestingly enough, most cases judged under Lemon do focus on entanglement, as purpose is generally difficult to discern, and often the effect of the law is not predictable. Partly because of the difficulties applying the purpose and effect clauses, Justice O'Connor proposed the endorsement test as a clarification of Lemon. She believed strongly that the government shouldn't make religion relevant to a person's ability to participate in public life. The Establishment Clause prohibits government from making adherence to a religion relevant in any way to a person standing in the political community. She wrote, Endorsement sends a message to non-adherents that they are outsiders, not full members of the political community, and an accompanying message to adherents that they are insiders, favored members of the political community. The proper inquiry under the purpose prong of Lemon, I submit, is whether the government intends to convey a message of endorsement or disapproval of religion. The question arises, of course, of the billing the cat. How do you decide whether a policy or law endorsed or disapproved of religion? O'Connor proposed that you consider whether a citizen a reasonable, informed observer who was aware of the history and context of the law or display would conclude that the government was endorsing a disproving religion. If so, the law or practice violated the Establishment Clause. Both the original Lemon decision and the endorsement modification have come under criticism by various judges and scholars. Judges have complained that it's difficult to apply, it's very subjective, it results in inconsistent decisions, 
Sometimes a crash in a public place is constitutional, sometimes it isn't. Furthermore, how do you infer what a reasonable observer would know about a law or situation? How knowledgeable would such a reasonable observer have to be? And maybe how reasonable? Conservatives on the court have been especially harsh about Lemon, as Scalia here. He wrote, like some ghoul in a late night horror movie that repeatedly sits up in its grave and shuffles abroad after being repeatedly killed and buried, Lemon stalks our Establishment Clause jurisprudence once again. Thomas called for the abandonment of Lemon on several occasions. But you know where Lemon, with or without the endorsement test, really works well with creationism and evolution cases. All of the cases after 1971 cite Lemon versus Kurtzman as precedent. In every single one of these cases, it is clear that there is a religious purpose to passing the law requiring creationism or whatever. And in almost all cases, there's a clear religious effect. You teach children that uh, creationism is true, you're advancing religion, full stop. In most cases, the courts also decided that entanglement is a problem. As it happens, you only need one of the three. So most of these cases stopped at purpose. Dear dad, go away. What largely has kept creationism out of our schools is the legal decisions. The Constitution is silent on the science curriculum. I bring up the importance of Lemon because there has been a recent development that may threaten the status quo on the teaching of evolution. This is the case of Kennedy versus Bremerton. In June of 2022, the Supreme Court issued a decision that you probably heard about because this is the one about the praying football coach. Joseph Kennedy was an assistant football coach at Bremerton High School, a town near Seattle in Washington State. He had served 20 years in the Marine Corps and was working as a manager with the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. The assistant football coach job is a part-time job and seasonal from spring training through summer and fall. I'm bringing that up because it wasn't like the guy is losing his livelihood. This is a hobby. In an op-ed for Fox News, he wrote, quote, before I coached my first game in 2008, I made a commitment to God that I would give thanks after each game, win or lose, for the opportunity to be a football coach and for my players. I was inspired to do this after watching the movie Facing the Giants. I had never heard of Facing the Giants, but I looked it up because Wikipedia is a wonderful source. This movie concerns an underdog Christian school football team that wins the state champion because their coach and they themselves trusted God and got the confidence to win. And the football coach is the hero of the movie. He would pray with the students in the locker room before game and after the game would pray at the 50 yard line because he had promised God he would. Students from his team and even the opposing team and coach would often join him in prayer at the 50-yard line after the game. One day in 2015, another coach uh, was talking to the Bremerton High School principal that he thought it was pretty cool that uh, Bremerton let um, the district let Kennedy pray on the 50-yard line, which was pretty great. Well, this was news to the principal. And so the district investigated and found that Kennedy had been praying and kneeling uh, after games for years. Um, also, after practice, he would, quote, hold aloft student helmets and deliver speeches with overtly religious references, which Kennedy described as prayers, while players kneeled around him. That's a quotation from the decision. Before the game, on September 11th, 2015, the athletic director told him he shouldn't be conducting prayers with players. After the game, while the athletic director watched, Kennedy led a prayer out loud, holding up a player's helmet as the players kneeled around him. While riding the bus home with the team, Kennedy posted on Facebook that he thought he might have just been fired for praying. This did not sit well with the administration, which wrote him a letter a few days later on September 17, informing him that Look, leading prayers with students was likely an establishment clause violation that would get him and the district in trouble. So please knock it off. The district letter is, is really very gentle. It, it offers to help him with this issue. Can we find a time and place for you to pray where you will not be leading students? He can pray privately as long as it doesn't interfere with his job responsibilities and as long as it wasn't around students or the public. In other words, a personal private prayer. Well, Kennedy did stop the locker room prayers, and then he got a lawyer. 
the Texas-based First Liberty Institute contacted him and offered their services. The next month, October 14, Kennedy's lawyers wrote the district informing them that Coach Joe was going to resume fraying on the 50-yard line at the homecoming game two days later. And the October 16 game was when things really fell apart. That's him in the blue, kind of in the middle there. Uh, You can sort of see him hunched over. He had generated media coverage through Facebook posts and media appearances. So after the game, he knelt on the field with students and the public streamed onto the field in support. The descriptions of the event suggested chaos. Adults broke down fences and even knocked down student band members in their rush to get to midfield. The district followed up with another warning letter on October 23rd, again offering an accommodation for private prayer. The district told Kennedy he could pray before and after the game when he wasn't on duty and students weren't around, but he wanted to pray publicly in the role of a mentor. His attorneys promised the media that Kennedy would be praying again at the October 23 and October 26 games. Again, he was joined by players and members of the public, including politicians. On October 28, the district put him on paid administrative leave. At the end of the year, the head coach gave him a negative review on the grounds of not following district directives and also for, quote, contributing to negative relations between parents, students, community members, coaches, and the school district, and for failure to supervise students after games because he was too busy with media and community. By the way, the head coach had been there for 11 years and uh, resigned that year because he was afraid of being shot at by people in the stands. And three out of five of the assistant coaches similarly did not apply for their jobs. Kennedy filed suit. He sued on free speech and free exercise grounds. The district replied, citing Establishment Clause responsibilities of keeping students free from religious coercion. The case went back and forth from district to appeals, as such things often do, with Kennedy losing at every turn. The district and appeals courts agreed that his free speech claims would not hold because he was on the job. Therefore, his speech was that of an employee, not a private citizen. Employee speech is not covered in the same way as free speech is for a private citizen. Thus, he could not proselytize while he was representing the district. The appeals and district courts also rejected the free exercise claim because the district tried to accommodate him, but he refused to cooperate, insisting on a public display of prayer. Finally, the case made its way to the Supreme Court, and oral arguments were heard April 25, 2022. The district brought in Americans United for Separation of Church and State to handle the appeal. Here's my very good friend Richard Katsky. Full disclosure, I have served on the Americans United Board of Trustees. Oral arguments were frustrating to listen to because it was clear that there were many discrepancies between the story being told by the plaintiff and the defense. Although the Americans United lawyer gently tried to point out where the justices got things wrong, like Kennedy hadn't been fired but was put on paid leave, and this was a part-time, part-of-the-year job, And he hadn't applied for the assistant coaching job in the fall, like all the others, so he certainly could not have been fired from a job he didn't have. The 6-3 to decision that came down on June 27 from Gorsuch read like it referred to a different case. This is made especially clear if you read Sotomayor's dissent, which was joined by Breyer and Kagan. Her dissent points out what the majority opinion ignores about the factual record. Gorsuch says that Kennedy's prayers were private, personal and quiet. (laughs) They were none of the above. Uh, He focuses on the three games in the fall of 2015, ignoring the seven-year history of prayer in the field and in locker rooms during coaching time, and Kennedy's insistence on public rather than private prayer where students could see and join him. Gorsuch also ignored student expression of coercion to participate to get playing time. It's, I think, very notable that after Coach Joe was suspended, the students didn't pray on their own. There was no effort by students to kneel at midfield, which would have been perfectly legal for them to do. Gorsuch also ignores the chaos that Kennedy's insistence on public prayer caused during these games. Sotomayor even includes two photographs in her dissent. Now, lawyer friends of mine tell me this is virtually unheard of in Supreme Court decisions or dissents or concurrences, that you just don't find pictures in these. This is not the Illustrated uh, magazine. The pictures show clearly that these are not personal, private, and quiet prayers. 
But as interesting as the details of this case are for general church and state separation, I want to focus today on another component to Kennedy versus Bremerton, which is the overturning of Lemon versus Kurtzman. As mentioned earlier, the late Justice Scalia and Gorsuch, Thomas Kavanaugh, and other conservative justices have been gunning for Lemon for a long time. And the Kennedy case, the facts of which were misstated by Gorsuch, was the opportunity they took to finally nail down its coffin lid. As Sotomayor points out, overturning Lemon puts decades of precedent in jeopardy including, of course, the long list of creationism and evolution cases, all of which were perfectly decided using Lemon. Lemon is exquisite for creation and evolution cases, regardless of what its shortcomings may or may not be for prayer or display or whatever. Well, okay, so if Lemon's dead, it's not to be used as a precedent going forward. What does the court suggest be used to decide whether a policy or law violates the Establishment Clause? Something Gorsuch called history and tradition. Now, this is part of the current court's enthusiasm for originalism in all of its varieties, hearkening back to what the Founding Fathers understood about the issue at hand. Well, for starters, there were no public schools in the 1700s, and there was no alternative to biblical creationism either. Evolution hadn't been developed as a principle of science when the founding fathers were around, so they would not have had an opinion on this topic. History and tradition strikes me as a particularly slippery criterion upon which to base Establishment Clause jurisprudence. It seems to me that history and tradition can be cherry-picked to support a wide range of conclusions, including contradictory ones. This, of course, means that the facts of a case would be essential in a decision. And as we've seen in the Kennedy case, the facts can be, well, in this case, ignored. Do you recall that wacky Arkansas bill that was proposed a couple of years ago? Or I guess 2021. It passed the House, by the way, believe it or not, and was only narrowly defeated in a Senate committee. Our experience with these laws is if they do get out of committee and onto the floor, they are very hard to vote against. Now, the Arkansas 1701 would have allowed creationism to be taught. Well, the sponsor of the bill was reminded that Arkansas has had a rather bad track record with creationism bills, but the sponsor plowed right on. Ferguson reminded Bentley, Bentley's the proposer, that the federal courts, including McLean versus Arkansas, have repeatedly held that teaching creationism in the public schools is unconstitutional. In response, Bentley expressed the hope that with changes in the Supreme Court, her bill might ultimately survive constitutional scrutiny. And remember, this was two years before Kennedy versus Bremerton. I think we need to be very aware that pressure to balance evolution might well come back within a few years. As creation science and ID proponents gear up to explore the tendencies for this Supreme Court to privilege free exercise over establishment clause in church and state cases, they might very well have before them a case about the teaching of creation science, intelligent design, or evidence against evolution. So stay tuned. And my former NCSE colleagues may well have their hands full once again. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to your meeting, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, I, I told you it'd be depressing. <laughs> the first question is, what do we do? Do you have any recommendations? Well, keep track of what's going on in your own school districts. It's much, much better to nip these things in the bud than to let them become established policy. Uh, these issues are more likely to show up first at a local school board. In California, it's very unlikely that the state legislature is going to countenance any kind of creationism bill. For anybody listening to this talk in other states, pay attention. Because in many other states, particularly those with religiously conservative major components to their populations, these bills are very popular. Bills like that Arkansas bill that I showed you. So, you know, pay attention and oppose these bills. If you get wind of anything like that, contact the National Center for Science Education, ncse.ngo. Uh, they will put you together with like-minded people in your community and states to try to fight these laws. And, you know, it really does require local activism to uh, nip these things in the bud, which is how they have to be treated.
um, two thoughts. One is um, many of us here on this call no longer have kids in the public school system. They're all grown up <laughs> and on their own. Um, but I guess for our, some of our grandchildren and stuff. So what's the best way to, to keep up with what's going on in the schools? Is it attending school board meetings, something like that? And the, my second question is, we still have these good news clubs and the after school activities. Do you see any kind of a threat coming from, from those activities? Well, you know, as long as a, as a student club is student led and it does not have a teacher uh, or employee of the district leading the, the activities, leading the prayers, whatever's going on there, it's, it's perfectly legitimate. There are schools that have started humanist student associations as well, and that is obviously another way to do it. You were asking about how do you find out what's going on in your school district? Well, unfortunately, there has been a rather a dearth of local news. Local newspapers are dying on the vine. In Berkeley, we're very fortunate because we have an online local news outlet called Berkeley Side. There are other online news outlets that actually do cover local school boards and find out if you have one of those in your community and just pay attention. Yes, uh, people my age <laughs> don't have school children, but I do have a grandchild that's going to be in the public schools pretty soon. So I, I will be paying attention as well. Watch the news, watch social media will often point things. Make friends with some teachers who are often paying attention to these issues. And they are going to be concerned about what they're going to be required to do. But also keep track at NCSC. NCSC is just one little organization that can't follow things as closely as individuals who are on the ground can follow them. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Daniel. He says, why do creationists dump so much money into museums? Is it a proven fast track to child indoctrination? Well, everybody likes museums. It uh, happens to be that museums are extraordinarily popular um, among Americans. I remember seeing a statistic a few years ago that more Americans went to museums than attended baseball games. So museums are very popular. Informal science is what they're called. And uh, creationists also understand very clearly that all kids like dinosaurs. So as long as you've got dinosaurs in your museum, you're going to get people bringing their kids to the museum. And then, of course, once they find out that this is an anti-evolution museum, then clearly you're going to get all the conservative Christian parents bringing their kids in, and, and they're very happy to have that. But yeah, there's quite a bunch of creationist museums around the country, including those mega museums like the one at ICR in Dallas, and of course our friends up at AIG. Wow, great. Judy Fontana. It's one thing to look on the local level, but are there groups out there trying to come up with a law, well, like Dobbs, putting something um, forward at the federal level that will work its way up to the Supreme Court? And how do we counter that? Well, there's not likely to be a national law about teaching creationism. And that is because education is very decentralized in the United States. Decisions about who teaches, what they teach, what they're going to be paid, those are all made at the local level. There is some state influence on uh, curriculum. Uh, most states have a science framework, a math framework, a social science framework, etc. Yeah, but those are not always required to be taught by every district. Districts really have an enormous amount of independence. Most of them do adopt the state standards because it's a lot cheaper than doing your own. And generally the state standards are you know, done by professionals and they're pretty good. The state standards for, I think all the states now, do include the teaching of evolution. So evolution is in textbooks. There's a very good probability that evolution is being taught in your local high school. It may not be taught as well as we'd like it to be taught or as completely, but it's then there. It's a whole lot better than it was 15, 20 years ago. It is very, it's very unlikely that there would be a national bill. What's much more likely to happen is, uh, you know, a bill like the Arkansas bill is going to be resubmitted next year. I can bet you dollars to donuts. And the supporter of that bill and clones are like it around the country are going to argue, well, the Supreme Court had said in Kennedy that, you know, uh, that it's okay to do this, which it didn't say. But the fact that 
Lemon versus Kurtzman has been removed is a very serious issue because, like I said, all of the creation and evolution cases uh, that I listed there were decided on the basis of Lemon, and now Lemon is no longer precedent. I'm just wondering what history uh, justices are going to look at, you know, history and tradition, right? Is it going to be the history of um, praying in school? Because that, <laughs> raise your hand if you prayed in elementary school. A lot of people who look like me on this we're there. Yeah, we, you know, we, we had the pledge, and we sang a patriotic song, and we, uh, we s said generally the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Very Protestant. What's going to happen in the future? Some local school district is going to pass a policy. It'll be challenged. It'll go up to the Supreme Court. And then what? We'll have to see. Yeah, my school district, when I was growing up, elementary school, on Monday afternoons, they would bus us all to the local Catholic school for religious instruction training. And it was our public school buses that took us there. Were you a Catholic? At that time. Yeah, okay. I'm not anymore. Well, that's, that's something, well, right. Hmm. Yeah, the head of the local humanist group is probably not a, anyway. Um, <laughs> that, that said, that's called release time. The Jewish kids would get out too. The Catholic kids could be bused. And I'm sure that in religiously conservative parts, the conservative Protestant kids would get release time as well. And this was perfectly uh, legal to do. But again, it just shows the accommodation for the free exercise clause, as opposed to the establishment clause. The establishment clause has been our bulwark for prayer, for display, for these curriculum issues. And now it's had a, a very serious weakening. And by the way, I, I forgot a disclaimer at the beginning of my talk. I am not a lawyer. Uh, I can hum a few bars for this particularly tiny little narrow area of the creationism and evolution controversy. But I, I always want to warn people in advance, do not rely upon legal advice from a physical anthropologist. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Uh, there was a question in the chat whether civilized countries are having this conflict or it's only in the U.S. Oh, yeah. It says, are other democratic countries around the world having similar creationist movements? Yeah, I think we've got Linda here from Canada, I think. I don't know what's, if anything's going on there. Or Eugenia, if you're aware of yeah. this happening. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we pay a lot of attention to what goes on in other countries as well. Yes, there are creationist movements in other countries. Um, it is basically transplanted American creationism. But just like in the United States, after about the mid 2000s, certainly by 2010 or so, the creationist movement started losing pep, as it were, because they, you know, be, losing pep in the sense of getting into the public schools. Obviously, they're doing fine. Look at all those great big museums all over the place. I mean, that that's something to remember. These people have not gone away. They've just sort of gone under the radar some more. And the same thing has been happening in other countries as well. In the former Soviet Union, for example, back in, you know, 90s and 2000s, everybody, of course, wants to learn English because that's how you get ahead in the modern world. So uh, they welcomed people coming in to teach English. And of course, the people coming in to teach English were Christian missionaries and generally speaking, conservative Christian missionaries. And along with teaching you English, they would also teach you that evolution was a lot of rubbish. And here's this great new science called creation science. And the earth is only 10,000 years old. And you know that started the movements there. Wherever you have strong conservative Protestant religious movements, you have the potential, if not the actual growth of a creationist movement. So Brazil, a very good example. Conservative Christians, their former president, who was thrown in jail for other shortcomings. Uh, the former president was a evangelical Christian. And that's, you know, evangelical Christianity has grown considerably in Latin and Central America at the expense of Catholic because uh, partly liberation theology and, and things like that. At any rate, I digress. Um, yes, it is elsewhere. I've actually written a little article on this. Uh, the main reason why it's so strong here is because of our decentralized education. So, you know, a thousand flowers and weeds can grow. Uh, but also because our form of Protestant Christianity is a lot more conservative than, than that in other parts of the world. Linda? I just want to say that in Russia, part of that could be because Putin himself is a right winger. So he sees this as supporting his political agenda. Yes and no, because remember, Putin is also pushing uh, Russian Orthodox. He's not really pushing uh, the Baptists. He's not pushing the conservative Protestants. 
which really is the, you know, is the foundation for the anti-evolution movement. Russian Orthodox hasn't said much about uh, creationism. The Serbian Orthodox has been a little bit mushy. Um, I think the, the situation with Putin is a little bit more complicated than that. I don't know how does anybody know much about Putin? I don't know how personally uh, deeply religious he is. He may be, for all I know. But I also know that he has built up the Russian Orthodox Church as a symbol of Mother Russia for nationalistic purposes as much as anything else. What do you know about uh, evolution in Muslim countries? It varies, but in general, it is viewed with suspicion. Remember that uh, unlike the Catholics, <laughs> and uh, either Orthodox or uh, Roman Catholics, Islam is not a hierarchical religion. There is no Muslim Pope. And basically, you have people who follow different imams. And so you get a terrific variety of theology with uh, all of which identifies with Islam. And there certainly are Muslim scientists who have no problem with evolution whatsoever. And there are plenty of imams who think that uh, evolution is a terrible idea because it is not compatible with the literal reading of the creation story as expressed in the Quran, which is, of course, the same creation story as you find in the other Middle Eastern monotheisms. It's the Adam and Eve and the whole nine yards. An interesting example is Iran, which is also parallel to the Russian example I was using a moment ago. In Iran, there's a very strong anti-evolution movement that was started by a very charismatic cult leader who recently uh, was sentenced to like five life sentences. <laughs> it's very unlikely he'll ever get out. And this chap promoted anti-evolutionism, not so much the young earth creationism, although he, he got a lot of his ideas there, but he didn't really care so much about the age of the earth. He just cared about blasting evolution, not necessarily because of, and partly because of the creation story, but also because it was a symbol of the West. Evolution is Darwinism, is Western science, is the West, and we in Iran don't like the West. So we're going to um, distinguish ourselves from a nationalistic standpoint, from uh, embracing this um, radical doctrine of evolution. So Islam is all over the place, but generally pretty negative. Okay, great. Really appreciate your time and pulling together all this new information and coming back and talking with us again. You're welcome. Thank you to Dr. Scott for talking with us. Thanks to all of you for attending. And thanks for supporting the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara.